Hi, welcome to Connecting Classrooms TV series brought to you by the British Council. Our topic today is deep learning and critical thinking and problem solving. Please participate actively. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the British Council Introduction to Core Skills for Teachers course. The aim of the course is to discuss and plan ways of integrating core skills, teaching and learning into everyday classroom practice. This does not mean changing the curriculum. We need to sound that very clearly. But it means adding an extra dimension to what you teach and how you teach. What are the key issues and techniques that we'll be covering during the TV series? Number one is what do we mean by deep learning? Number two, what skills and strategies can promote deep learning? And number three, how can we make space in the curriculum for core skills to be developed? Number four, what teaching approaches work best to help students develop core skills? Number five, how do we get others, such as head teachers and parents, to support the embedding of these skills in the curriculum? What do we expect of you? So every time we show the, the program, there are certain things that we expect from you as a learner. So now you're, you're becoming a learner rather than a teacher while this TV series will be ongoing. So you take, take on the role of a learner. So what do we expect of you? Number one is to think hard about how to apply the core skills to the subjects that you teach and try to implement some of the new ideas and approaches you have learned in your teaching and then find colleagues that you can connect with to share what you're learning and discuss how you're trying out the new ideas. It is also very important to say that we want to look at the Global Learning Crisis, a report by UNESCO. And in that report, uh, it shows regions of the world where the learning crisis hurts more. And so if you look at the graph, uh, so that I just show you the key and how you can interpret it. If you look down below that graph, you'll find the pencil. The pencil shows you the number of kids who have spent at least four years in school and learned the basics. That means they are learning the basics. The dark shaded line just after that pencil shows the number of children who have spent four years in school but did not learn the basics. And the thin line, which I doubt that you can see, but if you have very good eyes, sharp eyesight, you can actually see it. I don't have very good eyesight, so, <laughs> but I trust that most of you do have very good eyesight. Now, that thin line shows uh, the number of kids who have not even been in school in the last four years. They haven't spent at least four years in school. So let's start from the bottom. Now, not America and Western Europe. If I asked you whether you think that learning is occurring or whether learning is not occurring, your answer would be very clear, clear yes, because it is very indicative that they are learning. So learning is taking place in North America and Western Europe. And when we say learning, is learning the basics. Now look at Central and Eastern Europe. You find that learning is actually taking place there as well. And then you move up to Central Asia, Central Asia, you then begin to find that there are some kids who haven't spent four years in school, but it's negligible. Uh, we're not saying children should be abandoned. We're saying that if you compare that number to the numbers we're going to be showing you with regards to Sub-Saharan Africa, you know that there's a major problem in Sub-Saharan Africa. So having said that, let's just move very quickly to Arab states. Arab states, uh, you have kids who have spent four years in school that are learning the basics almost equaling the number of kids who have spent four years and didn't learn the basics. But you then look at Sub-Saharan Africa where Nigeria is situated. You'll find that the number of schools that we have in this country, the number of schools that we have in Africa, say Ghana, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, South Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, every part of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, tells you that there's a learning crisis that no matter the number of schools that we have, learning is not taking place. Learning is not taking place. And if you look for, at the topmost part of that graph, you find that the world is also suffering because of the setback that 
regions like sub-Saharan Africa, or South and West Asia are suffering as well and are going through in terms of the learning crisis. So the question I like to ask is that, does it surprise you that many children are in school but are not learning the basics? So take, take some time out to think about that question. Does it surprise you? But we have many children in school, but they are not learning the basics. I would also like you to look closely again at the figure and, and note down the key points that you can identify from the data shown above. The global learning crisis is evidently hurting some regions of the world much more than others. Again, I want you to think about it clearly and look at your practice as a teacher. Ask yourself this very pertinent question. Are my students learning? Are they learning? Are they really learning? Or am I just teaching and having fun? So that's the question that should be at the back of your mind as we go on. Are my students learning? Are they really learning? So we want to now look at Unit 1, which is about deep learning, critical thinking, and problem solving. And how deep learning relates to that, uh, that skill, critical thinking and problem solving. And as we go along, you will find that every time we do this program, you discover that deep learning relates actually to all of the other core skills. What are the learning outcomes for Unit 1? There are five of them, and we would like you to understand the difference between deep and shallow learning, understand how deep learning works, and have practical tips for deep learning in the classroom, and then how you model critical thinking and problem solving for the kids. And we'll then finally look at useful questioning strategies that you can use in the classroom. I would like you to consider the following questions. What do you understand by deep learning? What comes to mind? What might be the benefits of deep learning if it happens in the class? Whether the students or kids are in school or they have left school or they are working, they've graduated, what would be the benefits of deep learning to them? And the final question is, where have you seen it in action? Now, your responses could be single words or short phrases. The intention is that together we'll build up a shared picture of what we think we mean by deep learning. So I'll give you, say, three minutes to think about these questions. What do you understand by deep learning? What might be the benefits of deep learning? Where have you seen it in action? It may not be up to three minutes, but just start thinking about it. And if you have a jotter, it's advisable that you have a jotter and a pen so that you can take down notes. So in your jotter, write quickly the answers to these three questions. I'll repeat the questions again. What do you understand by deep learning? What might be the benefits of deep learning? Where have you seen it in action? Your time starts now. Okay, so I assume you have taken now time to write the answers to these questions in your notebook. What you understand by deep learning? What might be the benefits of deep learning? Where have you seen it in action? So I, I guess you've written down your answer or answers, and hopefully you have given me some thoughts before writing. And while you're writing your answers, I'm also thinking that you're reflecting back on your practice in the classroom over the years before COVID-19. And again, you're also reflecting as to how you can even begin to teach effectively, whether it's on, the, on virtual platforms or in a traditional classroom post COVID-19. It is important that you reflect on these questions and then you can relate the questions to your daily practice as a teacher. Again, there's another task that I would like you to do there's a quote on your screen. I want you to think clearly about what the quote means to you. What does it mean to you? I'll read it. It says the biggest effects on student learning occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching and when students become their own teachers. And that quote is by Professor John Haiti. I'll take it again. The biggest effects on student learning 
occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching and when students become their own teachers. Again, I'd like you to write your answer in your notebook and keep reflecting on it. Keep reflecting on it. What does this quote mean to you? What does it mean to you? What do you think has the biggest effect on your students? And when we talk about the effect on students, we're talking about the students' learning outcomes, the students' outcomes. So take some time, look at the quote again on your screen, and see if you can write an answer in your notebook, and then keep reflecting on it. What does it mean to you as a teacher? I read it again. It says the biggest effect on student learning occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching and when students become their own teachers. I'm sure you clearly understand what that means. It means rule reversal in the classroom where the teacher doesn't just come in as a teacher but also comes in with the mindset of a learner. So at some point you're teaching and at some point you're learning. And the children are so fascinated or students by the fact that you're willing to learn from them. And then you also provide the opportunities for them to also become teachers of what they are learning. Because sometimes what makes what we learn stick more in our minds or memories is because we're able to teach another person. So Haiti is saying that the biggest effects on student learning occur when teachers become learners of their own teaching and when students become their own, their own teachers. Let's move on. I'm sure you can see clearly the table on your screen and it's about behaviors, learning behaviors, learning behaviors. I like you to look at all of them. There are about 14 statements here, but out of those 14 statements, I want you to think clearly which of these behaviors is always beneficial to learning. Remember we said there is a learning crisis. It is not a teaching crisis. So we have teachers, qualified teachers, we have great schools, beautiful schools, beautiful infrastructures, wonderful environment to teach. But again, the report says that there's a learning crisis. Irrespective of all of those things that I've mentioned, learning is in serious crisis. So look at the statements in on your screen. You don't have to look at all of them, but just speak two or three out of them and think clearly. Do you think that these learning behaviors would always be beneficial to learning. And in your notebook, please write whichever one you look at and you think is always beneficial to learning, put a yes. If you think it's not always beneficial to learning, put a no. If you're not sure, put a question mark. So I take just a few of them. Number one, it is always beneficial to learning when students understand concepts. What do you think? What do you think? I think it's a yes, because the foundation for every learning is that people or students or learners understand the concepts that they are learning. Let's take another one. It is always beneficial to learn when students are motivated by fear of failure. Hmm, that's a tough one. What do you think? What do you think? Some people will quickly say yes. And some will say no. And the smart ones will say they are not sure with a question mark. And I like when people are not sure. It means that you can take either stand, right? When we be begin to debate the answers. But let me just state clearly that it is always very impossible for anyone to learn out of fear. I mean, you may pass exams because you're afraid of failing. You're afraid of what your parents will say. You're afraid of what the teacher will say. You're afraid of labels. You're afraid of what your your classmates would also say but nobody ever learns out of fear nobody so fear cannot motivate people to learn fear may motivate you to want to pass exams and cram and then write the exams and pass the exams but what should motivate a student or a learner is clearly interest interest let's take one more let's take one more or two more it is always beneficial to learn in when students rely on formula. It is always beneficial. Now, some will say yes, because we usually don't give it enough thoughts. 
and some will say for subjects like mathematics, physics, chemistry, most science subjects require that students rely on formula. Now, let me state clearly that there's nothing absolutely wrong with any of the statements here. What we're saying is that some of them will be beneficial to learning always, while some of them will not always be beneficial to learning. And some of them will lead to deep learning, while some will lead to shallow learning. And on your screen, you've, you, you can see that we have the key there. DL means deep learning, SL means shallow learning. And so we're saying that if students begin to, if we say they should rely on formula, that can lead to shallow learning. Because a lot of times in the current uh, situation um, or the current way we live now, you find that people no longer rely on formula to do certain things. You can solve mathematical problems in different ways and arrive at the answer. There's nothing wrong with formula. But again, it is even better to teach the children how to derive you know, the formula than make them sit and memorize the formula. Because once you miss a step uh, during any exam, you can never get the answer correctly. So there's nothing wrong with relying on formula, but it is not always beneficial to learning. We'll take the last one. Explain reasoning. Is it always beneficial to learning when students can explain their reasoning? Yes, St students should be allowed or learners should be allowed to explain reasoning, why they, they are reasoning in a certain way. All right, so let's move on to the next thing. So deep learning versus surface learning. Learning behaviors such as those related to higher order thinking skills, for example, explaining reasoning, can lead to deeper learning when combined with learning behaviors related to lower order thinking skills, such as remembering. Remembering is the lowest order thinking skill. But unfortunately, in our climb in Africa, a lot of our students or learners are always wanting to memorize things so that they can remember them at least and write it down in the exam. And once the exams are over, they're not interested in doing any other thing with that information. Now, the second point says learning behaviors related to lower order thinking skills displayed on their own are likely to lead to learning that is less deep and that is surface learning we no longer want kids to learn in a surface where we want their learning to be deep we want their learning to be deep now this plumes taxonomy on your screen you find out that it's upside down and it's for a reason there's a reason why it's upside down uh, you have the lowest order thinking skills at the top which is remember uh, but of course, if you can't remember things and you don't understand them, then you can't apply that information. And once you can't apply information, you can't analyze, you can't evaluate, and you can't create. And so the highest other thinking skills, which you find at the deep end of the ocean floor, analyze, evaluate, create, enables kids to learn deeply. Now, the lowest skills, remember, understand, are picking out on the surface of this volcanic island. Now, deep learning is what sets us up to be lifelong learners. It takes us from knowing and remembering to understanding and beyond. It's about depth and richness in learning. It's about making robust connections between old and new knowledge. So let's look at critical thinking and problem solving. Let's look at that now. The first skill among the six core skills, critical thinking and problem solving. The British Council defines critical thinking as a self-directed thinking that produces new and innovative ideas and solves problems reflecting critically on learning experiences and processes and making effective decisions. It goes on to also say that problem solving is about whenever you have a goal which is blocked for any reason, lack of resources, lack of information, and so on, you have a problem. Whatever you do in order to achieve your goal is called problem solving. Problem solving. I would like you to take out time, maybe now, maybe after you just watch this series, to write your own definition in your notebook. Now, research has shown that one of the ways we can help students towards deeper learning is to use effective questions in all lessons and subjects. A teacher's effective use of questioning in the classroom will build students' abilities to think critically. A teacher's skillful use of questions can help students to make connections between their learning. Um, when I used to teach, in a school, certain secondary school, I realized that a lot of us as teachers were very quick to, you know, set exams 
exam questions by looking for past question papers or questions that we have at the back of textbooks. And that was very useful. It wasn't useful to the students. But we're saying that while you're teaching in the classroom, you're using effective questioning to drive learning. You're making your students to think clearly in the classroom. All right, that's what we mean here. There are four types of questions we would like to cover. Some of us know closed questions, open questions, but the newer ones uh, include surface questions and deep questions. Write in your notebook, please, what you think these questions, types of questions mean. What do you think they mean in your notebook? Just take about a minute to write it down. What do you think they mean? Closed questions, open questions, surface questions, deep questions. What do they mean to you? When you hear those types of questions, what comes to your mind? As a teacher, what comes to your mind? All right, let's take a look at these questions and what they mean. So close questions are the topmost part of your screen to the left-hand side. Close questions are factual and focus on a correct response. An example of a closed question is on the right-hand side of your screen. What factors increase the rate of transpiration in plants? And you have four definite answers, light, temperature, wind, and humidity. So those are factual. Those are the correct response or responses. Light, temperature, wind, humidity. Now open questions will have a variety of answers depending on the depth of the student's thinking. So the question, an example can be, why do plants wilt? And you find that your students will begin to answer based on their individual understanding of what you're asking them to write. Surface questions will elicit one idea or some ideas. An example is explain how wind affects the rate of transpiration. So you're moving your students from a very shallow level and you're taking them into the depth of learning. Look at the close question again. What factors increase the rate of transpiration in plants? And the answers include light, temperature, wind, and humidity. Now, surface questions elicit one idea, some ideas. Look at the question, explain how wind. So you're saying, you have told me in the closed question, and your answer is correct, that light, temperature, wind, and humidity are the factors that increase the rate of transmission in plants. So you're asking the student or the learner a very specific question now. How does wind affect the rate of transpiration? It can also be how does temperature, how does humidity, how does light affect the rate of transpiration? And the final type of questions is deep questions or are deep questions. Deep questions elicit relations between ideas and extended ideas. And I love this question. Let's read it together. One, two, go. Why do wet clothes on the washing line dry faster on a warm, windy day? Wow. Just ask yourself, what will this type of question do to the minds of the learner or the learners? What will this type of question do to the minds of the learners? What will it do to their minds? How will they react if they see this kind of question? But you see, this is just like a scaffolding. The closed question relates to the open question, relates to the surface question, and relates to the deep question. But you scaffolded the learning for the kids. There's nothing wrong with closed questions, nothing wrong with open questions, nothing wrong with surface questions, but they all should lead to the depth of learning that we're looking for. And so the child who knows that wind affects the rate of transpiration, and I can explain it, may not know but it's the same thing that is playing out when you dry clothes on a washing line on a warm, windy day. So when you ask the question and the child gets the answer, the child is likely to now take this learning into the real world. So for instance, you pour water out the friend's book. The child who knows that wet clothes dry faster on a warm, windy day will tell the friend, take your notebook outside. If it is windy, it is going to dry up very quickly. That is deep learning. 
that is how you use questions to drive deep learning in the classroom. All right. So higher level thinking skills will need to be used to give a satisfactory response to a deep question. These types of questions are good for developing students' critical thinking, although care should be taken not to make them out of reach as this can be demotivating. So you have to be careful how you scaffold, how you ask the questions. You have to be really careful. Because of the complex nature of the questions and responses, some students may require a hint to point them in the right direction if they are struggling. So if you find that you've asked a question and your students are struggling, provide a hint for them. You're not asking them questions to, to find out who is smart or who is the smartest. No, you're asking questions, remember, to help them move into a depth of learning that would affect them and how they do things in the real world. So if you find that a student is struggling, provide hints for them so that they can answer the question that you've asked them. Finally, asking questions that begin with what if and why can help you delve deeper into students' thinking. What if we mix water with a color? Why do you think we can't mix water with a color? So those kinds of questions will get your students to start thinking and move deeper into the depth of critical thinking and problem solving. Okay, now we have said ask questions. And remember questioning will help your students to think deeply and think critically. In fact, I usually say in my face-to-face -face classes that thinking is driven by questions, the right questions. So these are some of the pitfalls that some teachers fall into, and we need you to be careful about them. Number one, it's not being clear about why you're asking the question. Number two, is asking too many close questions that need only a short answer. Number three, is asking too many questions at once. Number four, is asking difficult questions without building up to them. Number five is asking a question, then answering it yourself. And number six is focusing on a small number of pupils and not involving the whole class. Number seven is dealing ineffectively with wrong answers or misconceptions. Let me take number three, for instance, asking too many questions at once. You need to give them time to answer the question you have asked because they are thinking. You don't want to throw a spanner into the works, right? So you need them to think and give you the right answers. You don't also need to ask a difficult question almost immediately. Remember I talked about scaffolding. You need to scaffold your questions from close to open to surface and deep questions. And then the other pitfall that I find very amusing is asking a question then answering it yourself. What are mammals? Mammals fill their young with milk, right? You've answered it. So you've not given the students the room to think to make use of their brains, okay? And finally, i like to leave you with this. And let's see how many of you will know the answer. A duck, a goose, a horse, and a goat all enter a stable at different times during the day. A mammal entered the barn first. A duck entered before the goose. The goose entered ahead of the horse. Who entered the barn first? See if you can answer this question. All right. If you say it's a duck, you are wrong. If you say it's a goose, you are also wrong. If you say it's a horse, you are very wrong. If you say it's a goat, yes! That's the correct answer. Some of you will ask why. Now let's take a look at the question again. It says a mammal entered the band first. So the key word is mammal, a mammal. If you look up, there are only two mammals, a horse and a goat, a horse and a goat. A duck is not a mammal, a goose is not a mammal, a horse and a goat. The second line says a duck entered before the goose. So one bird has entered before the other bird. So. The first thing you take note of is that a mammal entered the band first. So in that band, there's a mammal that entered first, followed by a duck. After the duck is followed by the goose that entered ahead of the horse. Wow. So a mammal entered first. We're not told which mammal. 
but the crew begins to build from the second line. So a duck entered before the goose. So a mammal and a duck, and then a goose entered ahead of the horse. So a mammal, a duck, a goose, a horse. Now a horse is mentioned, meaning that the mammal that entered the band first was a horse. So where is the goat? And that is the answer. Hope you found today's class useful. Thanks for watching and see you in the next class. Bye.